Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Grant Cameron, and I have a special guest. I have Samuel Chong on today, and he is uh, an expert on Chinese ufology, which I'm very interested in because I've done um, um, a couple of shows out of China with uh, Chinese researchers and uh, stuff like that. So I'm, I'm very interested in this because it's a very important part of the world. Uh, most of the people live there. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Samuel's got some background. I'll get him to go through that and through his books. And we're going to talk about abduction, which is a very controversial topic. I've been involved in this uh, for many years. And I assure people that until you talk to the people who are actually engaging the phenomena, you're not going to solve this problem. You can look at all the lights in the sky you want. You can record them, do whatever you want. It's not until you talk to the people who are actually talking to the intelligence. So uh, Sammy has a very interesting story. He's a best-selling book. And I want to welcome him to my uh, channel here. And let's begin. How are you doing, Samuel? Good. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you for having me here. Beautiful. And you're down in uh, Los Angeles? Yes, in Los Angeles. How long have you been there? For about 25 years. 25 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you originally from China? Yes, I was born in Beijing in 1978. Ah, very cool, very cool. And and so what's the word for UFO in, in Mandarin? Uh, Feidie. Feidie? Feidie, yes. Okay. Like wow. flying saucers. There you go. And and you 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 mentioned, I think that it's um, very, very, um, there's a lot of experiences going on. I want to get you through that. But of course, today is the... Um, the address by Biden to the joint session of Congress. And uh, he is undoubtedly going to bring up the story of the Chinese balloon. So I, I have to ask you, what do you think about this whole story about the, the Chinese spy balloon? And, and, and what were your reactions when you were watching this whole thing unfold? Well, I think uh, they're trying to do a lot of terrible things to the people in China and in the US by waging this uh, unequal warfare. Um, it only takes about two or three thousand dollars to make the balloon. Uh -huh. but if you take it off by a missile or some other weapon, it's going to cost the U.S. government probably tens of thousands of dollars or thousand or hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's yeah. very unequal. So they're doing some kind of psychological um, warfare against the U.S. people, the people in the U.S., which is uh, really something that I I, I don't encourage. Yeah, and and you you've you you're familiar with the Chinese um, government and the policies. So let's go a little bit first through the policies of. Uh, does the Chinese uh, leadership ever talk about UFOs? Have they ever been forced to discuss it? And and what do you think they're doing behind the scenes? Well, the U.S. I mean, the Chinese government never uh, publicly stated uh, the existence of uh, UFOs or extraterrestrials. But I know that uh, in the 1980s or 90s, there were some sections of the Chinese military that dedicated themselves into researching supernatural abilities or psychic powers of certain people or Qigong masters. Uh, and I know people who were involved in those kind of projects. Yeah, I was, I was very interested. I know the CIA was watching uh, children in the 1980s in China with the telekinesis and stuff like that. And apparently... Uh, it's going on again. I was actually given a group in China, and I'm going to follow up on it, where they have these abilities to to do this stuff. And it would make sense that if you're um, you you want power, if you can learn how these abilities work, I mean that's militarily is is a, is a great advantage in terms of figuring out what these children do. Does does the Chinese did the Chinese see it as a as a as a um, sort of a mystery, or do they see it like the Americans are playing? putting it out now in the Congress. They're putting it out as this threat thing that, you know, these these UFOs are up to no good and uh, we have to have money to take them on and stuff. Did, does China see it as a threat or do they see it as an opportunity to learn something? Well, the Chinese people, uh, most of them are very ignorant about uh, what's going to happen in the future. And they don't necessarily see it as a threat, but they are trying to um, see how they can get most out of it, uh, the phenomenon, and also from the ETs. Uh, so this is why 
the book that I'm going to be talking about has been a bestseller in China and Taiwan because it gives them a lot of information how they can improve their lives and how they can elevate themselves spiritually. So, so talk a little bit about the book and talk about how you got it published in China because that um, is kind of a big effort in terms of um, what goes on in China. And maybe first describe to me, uh, is there a... Um, a a network where ufo experiencers can talk to each other like here we have you know twitter and facebook and and there's a lot of groups and people talk about it is there a um a, a um sort of a internet in china that where this stuff is discussed yes there are um i have like apps uh, on the phone called wechat there's an app called wechat that people can form groups and discuss their personal experiences um, and also the paranormal and I, I, I'm in one of, or a few of the groups that people discuss their experiences. Um, so far, the government hasn't been really encouraging people to discuss this kind of uh, things, especially in the last few years. In, in the past, in the 80s especially, there were UFO-related magazines that uh, were approved to be published in China. People, for example, I was uh, one of the most uh, zealous readers of the, those kind of magazines. Uh, but nowadays they're all prohibited by the government to 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 be published wow has, has anybody ever been um convicted or put in you know put in jail for these kind of activities and 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 is it really a serious threat to the people in terms of wanting to discuss this i mean the government do a lot of different things uh, secretly and without the public disclosure if they arrest people and people like me wouldn't know about it Wow. So so your book, talk about your book and talk about how, how it got published in China and what kind of numbers are we talking about in terms of uh, the books that are sold? Because from what I hear, I mean, it can be huge numbers of people that are involved in any one subject because there's just so many people there. Yes, I would say the readership of this book is in um, dozens of millions wow. or tens of millions of people because uh, people can... Uh, download free copies on the internet and uh, people also buy it from bookstores and it's just um, and a lot of people talk about this on the internet and the social media wow and you you published also in china was there a pro uh, in taiwan is is there was there a problem in having it in both places in terms of you know the tension that goes on between taiwan and china well, so far, the book is still under the radar from the uh, the government, the censorship, because in China, it's published as a science fiction. Uh, so that got it around the, the censorship over there. In Taiwan, it's published as a nonfiction and in two different versions uh, of the books. So it's very interesting how all things uh, get around. Wow. OK, so talk about the book. And, and the, you have a couple of books. So talk about you first, first name the books that you've you've sort of published. And then the one the with the abduction book, which I think is the will be the the book that sold the most and and the people are very interested in. Okay, the book, uh, the abduction book, is titled uh, Theoba Prophecy or Jehovah Prophecy. It's written actually by Michel de Marquet, a French Australian who had this personal experience in 1987, and he was taken away by this group of uh, friendly, compassionate ETs. Um, to their planet for nine days and then came back and he was informed about a lot of different things, the paranormal, the Bermuda Triangle, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, um, the human energy field and stories in the Bible and also the politics as well, how we need to improve ourselves and our system in the world. So this is one book that's very popular in China and Taiwan. The other book was uh, is titled uh, 334 Lies. Uh, written by a German person. Um, I translated from German into English. It's supposed to be an um, autobiography of the highest degree chair of a secret society that was founded in Germany. I did some research and found out that was the Illuminati. Um, before, I didn't believe that Illum Illuminati existed, and, but after reading the book and after looking at uh, other evidence, such as um, what uh, Rona Bernard uh, a Dutch banker uh, spoke about. I found a lot of uh, corroborating evidence that really convinced me that the Illuminati exists in the world and they're still influencing um, the politics in the world. Um, yeah, so those are the two books that I translated or caused to be published. 
Now, a question about the Illuminati. Do they, do they control everything like the money, the idea that they control the money and the, the, the politics around the world? And are they involved in UFOs and paranormal phenomena? Uh, directly and indirectly, they control a lot of uh, the monetary system and also politicians and, and the world, um, um, how, how the world is run. And the high degree members of that organization or secret society have supernatural powers. Um, so they can levitate, they can read minds, they can influence how people think um, by practice. And also a lot of ancient uh, practices um, are able to allow people to reach this kind of level of uh, having supernatural abilities. Um, just like uh, was uh, written in the Bible, what how Jesus was able to heal people. So those people can do that too. And so this is, uh, it explains a lot of different things, uncovers their rituals, how they're able to achieve this kind of supernatural abilities, and, and also the reason and the purpose of the, of the author revealing the secrets to the world. So what was his reason for releasing it and why the secrecy in terms of, I guess we can look at, you know, the, the Illuminati and also the secrecy surrounding UFOs all around the world, that there is no government that has really sort of come out. They're all very secret about what they may know about the phenomena. Well, the reason for the author to release uh, the secrets or reveal the secrets in 2001, when the book was published in Germany, in German, was because he found that uh, there was another person within the organization uh, who had a very evil intention uh, who was going to overpower him, that he really wanted to reveal such information so that the public, the people would know this um, so that they can form a concerted action or um, have a collective consciousness to really um, kind of break the organization apart from within. And, and so even though they have supernatural abilities. They can kill people using their mind. Uh, they're afraid of the power of the people. They're afraid of the, the collective consciousness. So this is the purpose of him revealing the book without naming any names. So he didn't name, he doesn't really name any names uh, for his own protection and for the protection of the others. But he reveals so many details um, that can be verified and co corroborating what uh, being said by Rona Bernard and others. Uh, so I found this book to be very credible as well. Wow. Now the abduction in 1987, he's gone for nine days. And I think you talked about his wife uh, questioning him. D did his wife go along with this when it was all said and done when he did the book? Or was it like most people where the spouse really thinks the person's kind of a little bit, you know, overzealous and this may not have happened. What was his wife's reaction? His wife uh, still to this day um, doesn't believe what happened to him. Yeah. She thought that he was having an affair with another woman. So that actually caused uh, his divorce. Uh, and until his death uh, about five years ago, um, she really refused to talk talk about it or or admit what happened to her husband. So he, uh, Michelle de Marquet, the author, um, after the divorce, was so depressed that uh, he decided to relocate himself to a southern island in Vietnam uh, at the suggestion of his friend, just to make himself feel a little bit better from all the. Um, um, disbeliefs of uh, his um, wife and also even the ufologists at that time in Australia. Now, he did he publish the book in China as well, or where was his book published? I think he republished it, right? Right. His book was originally published in Australia in 1993. Uh, it was reprinted a few times and then got published in China only like about uh, four years ago, and Taiwan about three years ago. Yeah. So wow. also published in Japan, in South Korea, and a few other countries. Wow. Do you, so you you speak a lot of languages, I take it, because you translated a German book. How many languages? You're a language specialist, I think, right? Yeah, I study different languages. I speak uh, Mandarin Chinese and English and Spanish. Uh, German, I uh, know a little bit, but I can get by um, for some things. And, but, but I think uh, it's very interesting that... Uh, uh, we are at a time in which I'm trying my best to promote the messages to the world that, so that people can wake up. 
So talk a little bit more about Michelle's experience um, in terms of what were the what did the beings look like and what was the planet? Was it was it in a certain constellation or where was the location? The planet Theuba or Jeova is in our galaxy. Uh, the Theubans look like uh, very beautiful, tall, like nine or eight or ten foot tall, blonde Nordic looking ETs. But those are hermaphrodites. They are hermaphrodites, meaning that they have uh, both male and female sexual organs. They are very friendly to us. And when Michel Demarquet met them, he felt great love and compassion compassion from them. They are able to perform all the miracles that performed by Jesus Christ. So they can levitate. They can heal people. They can also materialize or manifest objects out of thin air. They can also communicate uh, via telepathy. And they never age. They're all looking like uh, in their 30s. They can regenerate their body organs. And, and so they can do all the things that's, um, that seem to us to be mir miraculous. Wow. And, yeah, and they talked about the, the, their civilization being a nine or something. Was it what goes through that? scenario. Yes, so their civilization lives on a category nine planet. So according to them in the universe, uh, there are a total of nine different categories of planets. We on Earth are living on category one planet. Um, and indeed, we are like elementary school students trying to learn the basics. They're like college professors trying to guide us to the right direction. And they have been doing so throughout history, as recorded in the Bible. Wow. And and when he got there, is their civilization similar to ours in terms of buildings and, and their, what's their planet like? Well, very different, actually. When he got there, he saw like they have um, a building structure that's shaped like a half an egg. Um, when people are outside, they cannot see what's inside. When people enter inside, they can see outside. Uh -huh. So it's like a semi-transparent one-way mural. And um, they eat foods every two or three days. So they're uh, like a kind of powder and they also make mana, like a space food. So calories are released at um, even pace for different inter intervals. So that people don't feel hunger or thirst um, even, after, even after two days or so. And they can really download messages from each other. Um, just uh, by receiving knowledge in a very unique way. So they can the knowledge can be transferred from one person to another. And he also saw a lot of people on the planet uh, meditate. So they see that meditation is a very good uh, form of um, um, calling out their nature um, or connecting themselves to the great ether, the creator of the universe or, or, or God. They also suggest us to meditate as well, to connect with our higher self. So they say that when you have um, challenges or obstacles in life, the best way to respond to that is to um, look inside for answers and not look for answers from religious leaders or politicians or government organizations because the kingdom of God is within you. So this is their message that people should really look uh, what's happening around them and look inside for answers. Wow. And and they why did they choose him? Did they say why him or? Yes, according to him, um, they chose uh, people like him who have had who had had eighty past lives already. Um, so only people like Michelle Demarque can survive for nine days on their planet because of the different vibrations and and uh, other reasons as well. So if people with uh, lesser past lives, fewer past lives, they can only stay for fewer than nine days and, and then they would die. Um, and the other reason is that uh, Michel de Marquet uh, was a man of action. So he took immediate actions and followed their instructions to the letter by writing this book, detailing his personal experiences, what he saw, he witnessed and experienced. Um, they chose him because he was also a landscaper, a farmer in Australia. He didn't have any preconceived notions or presuppositions of what uh, ETs are to be like and what their agenda. He didn't have any agendas. So he was just like a blank piece of paper to write on. So he would be able to report truthfully what he encountered. 
Wow. You, you make an interesting point that the, the kingdom of God is within. I think that is sort of the message I've heard is this, this idea that um, I just did a book on people who were allowed to fly the craft and they would always be told it is within you. Go within yourself, wherever you want to go, and you'll go there. You got to see it inside yourself, and you see this over and over again. This idea that um, even John Wheeler, the famous physicist, said, "There's no out there, out there." It's this idea that you're, it's a participatory universe, and you are. It's almost like the universe is enfolded within you. So that's interesting. So they wanted him to write the book. Did he regret writing the book after he published it? Because he probably got a lot of, a lot of back. You know. Yes, reactions uh, from people yes he actually had a major depression after he um came back after he finished writing the book because people didn't believe him not even his uh, some of his close friends um so that's why he moved uh, to vietnam just to live the you know very reclusive life um didn't want to have people bother him anymore even when i first met him the first few days he was uh, really annoyed at my visit asking him all the questions. Um, he felt that uh, the questions were stupid questions. And But then after he found out that I was able to help him to get a book published in China, when that publisher refused to have it published, um, he and I established a very friendly working, working, working relationship. Um, he didn't know how to use the internet. He didn't know how to type. Until his death, he didn't know how to type. All, the, all our communications went through his uh, Vietnamese niece who uh, typed from his dictations. So that's why, like, uh, even though the book was uh, kind of like a bestseller in Australia locally, it wasn't really well known in the U.S. Right now, I'm taking the responsibility as my life mission to spread the messages to the people in the U.S. and around the world. And it's on Amazon? Uh, the, the books are all on Amazon? Yes, it's on Amazon and people can look it up. And uh, it's actually the best investment I've ever made by reading this book because I, not only did I learn about ET technologies that can benefit uh, people in a very positive way, like clean energy, like how they are able to travel at uh, a few times faster than speed of light uh, in deep space and, and also through teleportation. Uh, it also reveals a lot of uh, the mysteries of the paranormal on earth such as um, uh, who uh, what is ghost like some people say they can see ghosts what are the ghosts and also they have uh, very positive and friendly suggestions on how we can actually improve our current world affairs um, they named a few examples of how the ancient civilizations the ancient civilizations how they organize themselves politically how they elected their government officials. Um, and they actually took Michel de Marquet to the past because they uh, took him to what some people call the Akashic record, um, a, like a holographic kind of uh, environment in which he witnessed how people lived in ancient times. For example, he visited uh, the civilization that existed on the continent of Lemuria about uh, 14,500 years ago, he saw that people were so harmoniously living at that time, you know, very, very uh, peaceful manner that uh, it existed uh, no money. So people didn't use money to exchange uh, goods. They just took whatever they needed from the market and no one took advantage of another. Uh, crime was no, not a, uh, like a non-existence. Uh, and, and so he also saw a lot of different animals that uh, went, extinct, went extinct. He witnessed how the entire continent sunk into the ocean and how a great civilization was lost and their technologies and also uh, the people. And uh, that actually explained uh, how the Great Pyramid was made and built. Um, very interesting things that uh, can actually be verified by a lot of uh, scientists nowadays. And you tracked a lot down, like you tracked the author down, and you also went to Easter Island. Tell me, tell me that story. Yes. Um, the book really um, 
kind of uh, shocked me at the details, uh, specific verifiable facts. But in the postscript, it says there are more incredible things that the author was not allowed to write about. At that time, I thought the book is already incredible enough. What's more incredible that he was not allowed to write about? So out of curiosity, I decided to track him down. So that's when I found that he was living in Vietnam at that time. I took a, I printed a photo that a tourist took showing where he was living at that time at Bangalore. I showed it to the taxi driver after I landed in the airport um, and the taxi driver took me there. So that's when I was able to find him and to, to speak to him about the book. Um, so that's kind of um, very interesting. And uh, since then I've been helping to get a book published in other countries. And, and so far it's been um, kind of uh, interesting how, how people perceive this book. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, and you, you, you got to know him fairly well. And his his niece, did you did he ever tell you any of the stuff that wasn't in the book? Or did he open up about uh, other experiences that he had? Or was he just have the one experience? Well, he told me the things uh, he was not allowed to write in the book, uh, in which uh, um, some of the things he revealed publicly, which relate to the graves. Um, so according to him, there are graves um, that have been visiting us uh, in the past. They did um, put implants on about 150 people or so by the year 1995. The reason for them doing that is that they really wanted to observe us, how we respond to our increasingly decreased immune system because we have been having this issue since 1948. They wanted to do that because they're also having the same problems. They um, are a dying race as well. So they want to see how we respond to the same situation. Um, and there's absolutely no harm for, uh, for them doing so. And, and the Theobans, the Geovans uh, have been monitoring the activities of the grace just to make sure that uh, everything goes right. Um, but from my personal per perspective, um, because the Greece also come from a category one planet, if we really want to learn how to elevate ourselves, how to imp improve our society and lives and, and humanity, we should learn from the best. We should learn from the inhabitants of category nine planets, uh, like the Theobans. So I know that the US government has been collaborating with the Greys to gain their technologies. And I think um, it's probably more beneficial to learn from the Theobans and to maybe um, focus on this book, Theoba Prophecy, and to learn how Category 9 planet inhabitants use ET technologies in a way that is going to benefit uh, us in the future. Well, what would the perfect world that they're describing, what would it look like I mean, in terms of uh, how we should live? Um, to live in a world in which people focus on their spirituality. Uh, for example, um, what I mean by focusing on spirituality or having spiritual growth is to really follow the teachings of Jesus Christ in the New Testament of the Bible. It's just to... Now to do uh, what you don't want them to do to you. Um, so just to love your neighbors and to really not to be too in too focused on the material aspect of life. Uh, in a perfect world, uh, there will be no money, no monetary system at least. And people would uh, really uh, kind of treat each other uh, in a very compassionate, uh, nice way. And we help our neighbors when people are in need, we help them. And we also would uh, advance technologically um, in a way that would benefit our environment. For example, they encourage us to commercialize the clean technologies or hydrogen engines that were long discovered or invented by our scientists. They're being suppressed by special interest groups for example, Stanley Meyer, I don't know if you know him or not. 
um, he invented a, a car, a vehicle that ran on water in the 1970s. Okay. What he did was that he used a, a specific vibrational frequency that could split the water molecules into uh, hydrogen and oxygen atoms in a very energy efficient manner uh, by breaking the covalent bond of hydrogen and oxygen um, very easily using the uh, resonant effect. So when, when things resonate, they can really uh, break things very easily. So that's how he broke, or how he breaks the hydrogen and, and, and uh, from the water molecules and uh, using hydrogen as the energy source for his vehicle. So a lot of different inventors have come up with the same thing, like inventors from Brazil, from um, Greece, from other countries too, but they're not able to commercialize because they're either th uh, suppressed by by the big oil companies or they um, just, um, um, they're bought off. So so those are the things that uh, the ETs have been encouraging us to, to research and to really uh, focus on. The other technology would be anti-gravity uh, technologies. And uh, they say that by raising the vibration or frequency to a certain extent, and we could actually have neutralized gravity. So we would become weightless. And that's a very good way of uh, moving objects around. So this is how they built the Great Pyramid of Egypt in ancient times, about 17,000 years ago using anti-gravitational technologies, as well as uh, supersonic vibrational systems to cut the huge stones in a very precise manner. And the Great Pyramid was actually built as a tool to capture the cosmic and terrestrial energies so that the users of the Great Pyramid could concentrate the energies in a, in a manner so that they could communicate with people on other planets and also to make rain. Did Michelle's ETs were they around during the pyramids? How long have they been watching us? And uh, did they did they help in that building? No, they they weren't uh, involved in helping um, the builders of the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid of Egypt was actually built by Thoth from Atlantis. He had the knowledge from the ancient civilizations from Lemuria, uh, and he knew how to build it in a way that's perfectly aligned so that the energy could be used in, a, in, a, in the right way. Um, so we had the ancient civilizations on Lemuria, but also on Atlantis as well, but then they disappeared when, when, when natural disasters occurred. So when the civilization on, civilization on Lemuria was uh, prosperous, the Theobans, the ETs were actually in direct contact with the people there. So they were helping them and in direct communication with them because they were on equal footing um, on the same kind of um, spiritual level or development. So this is why a lot of people ask, why don't the ETs just uh, land on the in front of the White House and to make the public appearance? So the reason is that uh, we are not ready yet on a spiritual level. So imagine, you are in a forest in Africa. You see two groups of monkeys fighting against each other. Would you want to invite them to your beautiful mansion or beautiful house and make a public appearance saying, hey, come and visit us or let's make friends? You wouldn't because they're still fighting against themselves. They're, they're um, like uh, not civilized enough or not uh, spiritually grown enough uh, to the level that uh, that we can or they can communicate um, on equal level. You you talked about spirituality. Is that the bottom line to them? Is is that it's a spiritual life rather than a physical life? And you talked about reincarnation. I think one quarter of all experiencers claim that they were talked to about reincarnation. How does the world work in terms of the way that they describe it? In terms of why we're here, where we're going, what's happening. So Christ, who was sent by the ETs, by the Theobans, came to us just to teach spirituality and love. He died on the cross and then resurrected three days after, just to show people that there is life after death and there is reincarnation. 
What happens is that we have our physical body. We also have our astral body. When our physical body dies, our astral body leaves our physical body and re reunites with the higher self, which is actually part of uh, the great ether. And to be exact, 81% of the electrons of the astral body reunites with the higher self after three days. So the three-day period is actually very interesting because uh, uh, in Tibetan culture, the corpse of the dead are not to be touched for three days. So after three days, 81% uh, of electrons reunite with the higher self. And then there's, uh, there's the life reveal process in which um, everything happened in the lifetime will be revealed by the person, him or herself. He would be able to, or he or she would be able to feel how others felt when certain acts were conducted onto others. And uh, if he or she did a lot of wrong things, he or she would feel extremely regretful. And then, and then the person would really decide what to learn, what lessons to learn in the next life, and what kind of families to be reincarnated to into. Um, so, so that goes the cycle. It's a constant, constant uh, learning experience. Um, so we accumulate spiritual lessons this way in order to fulfill the uh, the needs of uh, um, the 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 creator of the universe. Uh, to satisfy his uh, spiritual needs through a physical experience. The other, Go ahead. Go ahead. the other nineteen percent of electrons remain on Earth uh, until they reincarnate or until they're recycled by nature. So when people say they can see ghosts, what they are seeing is that uh, the other nineteen percent of the electrons of the astral body of the dead, because the electrons. Um, because of the static forces of electrons, they resemble the appearance of the person who was alive before. And also because of uh, electrons also uh, have the ability to contain memories, um, ghosts frequently haunt the places they loved or hated. Wow, F fascinating. How has this changed your life in terms of wh where you were when you first read the book? And has your spiritual life changed? Has your, you know, what you do changed in terms of what you read? Did it really affect you and change your life? It really changed my life uh, for, the, to the, for the better. It really taught me the meaning of life and also um, how to respond to life challenges that we're going to be facing in the future. Was uh, really what really hit on me was actually the one thing he wasn't allowed to write in the book that has not been made public yet. Um, it really changed the course of my life. That's the main reason I've been dedicating myself, my time, to spreading the messages to the people in the world, because uh, we decide our future. The past is fixed. We can go to the past, uh, but the future really relies and depends on our actions, our collective consciousness, how we respond to certain situations that uh, we have been experiencing in the past few years. Um, so I was told not to reveal it publicly, uh, that one thing he didn't write in a book, but they didn't tell me that I wouldn't be able, I, I couldn't write an article about it, revealing as many hints as possible or giving as many clues as possible. And that, exact, that is exactly what I did. So I wrote an article on the second coming of Christ. <laughs> so it has a lot of uh, relation or kind of uh, information relating to the messages in the Bible. So that people are really curious about it. And after reading the book, Theoba Prophecy, if they, want, if they want to know about it, then they can read that article and to see uh, what the message is about. Is that article online? It's online, yes. Oh, okay. And is it, you've got a website, right? Yes, I have a website, uh, chinasona.org. Okay, well, I'll I'll try to link that with the with the notes so people can can follow there. And and what are you what are you doing now in terms of uh, are you doing more research or are you 
putting articles on your website or what are you what are you doing now besides i think your main object is to promote the the, the book yes i'm doing everything possible to promote the messages in the book i'm, I'm also doing a more research on secret societies because um, uh, this is something even though i translate the book um, the autobiography of the chair of the Illuminati, there are still many things that I don't know about. And, and especially how to make the world a better world in the future. Um, I do see that uh, um, people are strongly, are being strongly influenced by the mainstream media. I'm trying to get the words out to the mainstream um, society so that people can wake up. The key is uh, collective action a concerted action following the footsteps of um, Gandhi in India, using nonviolent resistance to rise up against tyranny. Um, so that's the way to go. And I think that's uh, going to make our world a better world. And I'm looking for help, people like you, like your audience, uh, to spread the messages to the people and also to people who can make the decisions. Well, the people that usually watch me will understand the message because I think you've got the message down pretty well in terms of what other people have been told, the same sort of thing that, you know, especially the spiritual aspect that, you know, how to make the world, you know, more of a one oneness thing rather than separation, you know, that you, everybody's connected, everybody's one and the ecology. Do they think we're in trouble in terms of our world, in terms of ecology and this sort of stuff? Yes. This is the reason they took the pain of uh, taking Michel de Marquet physically, physically to their planet, instructing him, instructing him in a very stern manner to report everything he saw um, by writing this book. And, and I think uh, the other time that they did that was according to Michel de Marquet was uh, in the times of uh, Enoch, when Enoch went away with uh, the Jehovah's or God. So if you compare the two events, um, the book of Enoch was actually the result of the instruction by, by God or Jehovah's asking Enoch to write a book. A few decades later, you know, his great grandson, Noah, was told to build an ark. So using the parallel comparison, I, I, I think you are going to know what's you know what's going to happen in the future if we don't change, if we don't mend our ways. So this is why I'm trying to do the best I can to send the messages to the people, people who will listen, so that we can change course of history, I mean, course of our directions, so that we wouldn't necessarily have to experience something uh, that, uh, that could be irreversible. How have the Chinese reacted in terms of is that changed the consciousness of people in China at the at the level of people that say at the bottom who are reading the book who might just be ordinary citizens are do you, and do you get um, reactions are you able to correspond with people in China that are that are involved? Yes, um, more and more people are getting words out about the messages. Uh, in the book, uh, not many of them, not all of them buy the book, they can download the book free of charge as well. Yeah. So a lot of people are waking up in China. And and I, and, and the fact that the author Michel de Marquet um, insisted the book to be published in mainland China uh, meant something because if you really look at the timing, the English version of the book was published in 1993, right after the uh, collapse of the former Soviet Union. And the timing, according to Michel de Marquet, was extremely crucial, important. And I do see great changes are coming to China. Um, and I hope that uh, uh, by reading this book, people will be ready when great changes come to them. Wow. You've done a fantastic job. I've listened to a lot of your interviews, and you are, I think, getting the word out. And consciousness is rising. Uh, I, I hope that I can help you move the message out there, because it is... It is a very important message, and I hope that uh, you know China and the United States sort of get it together and uh, and you know make make this step. He was he was re requested to write the book. Did they help him to write the book? Did they help him? They did. They did. Yeah, I've heard that many times before. That they 
they insist on it. And and do you think it's a, a life mission? Do you think this is a pre, you agreed to this before you came in, that this would be sort of a life mission of yours? I, I believe so. And uh, I verified again and again that no one else uh, knows about that message that he didn't put in the book. And I think uh, being able to uh, communicate in different languages and to uh, working as an interpreter, um, interacting with people from in different industries um, kind of lay a very good foundation for my future. Uh, but I still need people's help, people like you. Wow. Oh, well, I will do what I can to help you. But, but yourself, like, how did this all start for you? Because usually there's some sort of event that sort of triggers it and gets you going. How, what was your start to this whole thing that got you all in, involved in this? Well, I was uh, very interested in the paranormal and the unknown since I was very little. I read uh, the UFO magazines that was published in China. There was one story talking about the uh, scientists being taken by the ETs on their spacecraft. And the scientist was told that uh, the theorem of relativity has uh, one small mistake and so that they could travel at speed uh, faster than the speed of light. That caused me a lot of curiosity and fascination. And I decided to search and to link, to look into um, messages sent by the ETs or people who kind of interact with the ETs in order to obtain more knowledge, uh, more information, information about technologies. So that's always been in my subconscious mind. And that day came in 2014 that I found this book, The Oba Prophecy on Amazon. It reveals everything and the facts contained in the book can be verified. And they're very specific facts. Wow. So, so you have you had any personal experiences in terms of the paranormal or UFOs? No, um, personally, no. But I have some lucid dreams in the past. What I like, kind of, um, I hope is that I can take advantage of my lifetime, you know, uh, you, like as fully as possible without the assistance of um, the ETs, even the Theobans unless when it's absolutely necessary, because I learned the best when I'm more independent. When like, if you, if you think about the, like a parent trying to teach um, the son like a mathematical problem, um, if uh, the child is able to find the solutions on his own, then he would learn the most more vividly. If the solution is just given to him, and uh, he wouldn't learn as much. So this is what I'm trying to do, just to be relatively more independent and to find means to spread the messages. Wow. And you mentioned lucid dreams. Do you, can you get into the lucid dreams? Because lots of times you'll people will describe it and it's sort of like a guiding, whether it's your higher self guiding you or whatever it is. Were these involved in the, in the process? And did they sort of give you some direction as to what to do? The lucid dream that I had was uh, regarding reincarnation in, in the sense that my astral body goes to different levels from level two, level three, uh, and level five and level nine, and then goes into the great ether. And then when I'm bored and the, the astral body uh, wanted to, or the higher self wanted to break away from the great ether, and then the cycle goes again. So several cycles like that. And then in the lucid dream, I was uh, trying to move up to the ladder to a higher level of category of planets. And then I was told, uh, it's not the time yet. You have to go step by step. And that's the message that I got. Wow, that's that's fascinating. It's almost like like a pre, uh, sort of a movie script where you, you go through the whole thing as to, you know, your your direction as well. And, and so did he leave any notes behind Michel or did he, um, is are they record you know gathering his stuff or his to record you know his life? Well, uh, he before he passed away, he was uh, in the process of writing his own autobiography. Uh, he was about uh, he wrote about twenty or thirty pages by hand, manuscript by hand. But then um, he passed away so suddenly that. Uh, um, his family members, his Vietnamese family wasn't able to really uh, keep um, his manuscript in a very safe manner. So uh, it got lost. 
Wow. And how, how did you, how did you commit? So how much time did you spend with them in terms of uh, asking them questions and stuff? Were you there for, for quite a while? Yeah, I took uh, two trips to visit him. Wow. Uh, one trip was about five days and the other about uh, five days as well. So total about 10 days or so. Wow. And and he opened up to you in, in the end and realized that you could help him? Yeah, he he actually opened up himself and and he actually told me that uh, Tao, the, uh, the friendly ET, his uh, mentor, told him that someone was going to visit him. Is that right? <laughs> and then the, the, the beings, that's what he told me. Yeah, the being's name was Tal. Yeah, Tal. Wow. -E yeah. Yeah. yeah there, there's usually one being that does all the talking. That's sort of like the the almost like the guardian angel that's there and sort of directing the 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 whole thing. Very very interesting. And and uh, so, is there anything else you you need? What what's the basic message that you want out to people, other than to read the book and pick it up themselves? Because it would be the same sort of thing as if people read it, they would get ideas and be independent and and sort of change their what they're doing. But what what do you think the message is that that you need people to to realize from from what you've read? I think in the next uh, few months or a few years, we're going to encounter great challenges um, economically or financially or otherwise. So the way to respond to such challenges is to really look inside of yourself for answers, follow your gut feelings or intuition uh, by meditation or by, by having a good night's sleep or by doing, or through doing prayers, uh, by doing prayers. And also, um, do not be really brainwashed by the mainstream media in the future, or even now, when people tell you that there's going to be an ET invasion or alien invasion. Because uh, if you look at the facts, if you really think about it, um, we went to the moon about 50 years ago. We never went back, even though the cost went down and we are more advanced uh, technologically. The reason is that we were warned off from the moon um, yeah. because we were not ready to explore the universe or or even the solar system or maybe other planets. Um, so there are government narratives or maybe some kind of a plan to really create this kind of a enemy um, that uh, not China, not Russia, but ETs. So just uh, be careful about that because uh, if they warned us now to if they warned us from the moon warned off yeah if they prevent us from exploring the moon or mars then they would prevent others or even et specific evil intentions from visiting us as well so they are kind of protecting us or guarding us from the dangers of uh, evil-minded uh, et or alien races as well so i think uh, we are pretty well protected um, in that sense and it's also documented or written in this book how they helped uh, people in ancient times by preventing animals or insects from, from eating them out, eating the primitive people out. So, so I think uh, there's nothing to be worried about the ET or alien invasions. Uh, we should really look, uh, um, be careful about the, uh, how the media portrays certain things. Do you meditate yourself? I do occasionally, yes. Yeah. And and talk a little bit about the cover-up. I think you mentioned at one point that your understanding is that, that governments are sort of working secretly together. Yes. Um, yeah, this is not my first-hand information. So people can read uh, others like Stephen, Dr. Stephen Greer or other people to learn about uh, what the government has been doing or hiding from us. Um, but uh, I would say um, it's important to know that uh, the world doesn't run as what it appears to be run. So there's a gr small group of people pulling the strings, like uh, making the politicians like as puppets. Uh, because if you look at the, what's happening today, whether it's Republican or Democrat in the U.S., I know you're from Canada, but yeah. in the U.S., the parties come and go every four or eight years. But a small group of people uh, running everything behind the scenes, they remain the same. They 
always pull the strings. And it's important to know this, that we are just uh, uh, strongly being influenced by the politicians and we need to wake up and to, to act together. Uh, and the book gives a very good solution and we need to look at it very carefully. Wow, it's, it's a fa fascinating message and, and I hope we can, we can move it in terms of uh, the government because the government is sort of sort of still into the material aspect rather than the spiritual aspect. And when you talk to experiencers, you start getting this this idea that there is this spiritual component to it as well that pe that these beings are are trying to get across. Yes, there are so many specific facts mentioned in the book that can be verified. For example, they intervened during World War II preventing Germany from being the first country to develop the atomic bomb. Wow. And uh, I think I strongly suggest readers to read the book and to have uh, independent independent thinkings and, and really to act upon it because action um, is uh, much better than just um, thinking about it. Well, what do you think is preventing that? Do you think it's the, the media that people are sort of listening mostly to the media that, that's preventing people from making this sort of spiritual growth? Yes, the media and the politicians and, and most importantly, money, because everything is about money. Media try to print stories that are sensational, that, that can bring their benefits or money. And I think everything, the, the danger, the, the first danger on earth is money. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I think you've got all the messages down. I, I, I don't really disagree with any of the messages. I've heard them before. And I think uh, it's up to you and I to do what we can. We can't really force anybody to do anything, but our actions are, are the most important thing to, to sort of be the, the light that, that people can pick up on and, and, and listen to that. I think you're doing a, a fantastic job in terms of, of putting this out. And you do this part time, I guess you've got a, a full time job that you do. Yes, I'm doing it part time. Um, my full time, I'm a certified court interpreter and a Chinese translator. So I work with a lot of uh, lawyers, doctors, and also uh, the court, uh, the courthouses. Wow, fascinating! Is there anything else you you want to try to get across before we should close down? Um, just really want to encourage people to really look inside for answers and not to be influenced by the media or the politicians or religious leaders. And if you're a believer of uh, a certain religion, one thing I like to bring your attention is that religion is organized by people. Spirituality is something entirely different. We should focus on spiritual growth, not uh, specific religious doctrine. Well, Samuel, thank you for for spending some time with me, and perhaps we can do it again when you've got um, some more writing done. I hope people will look up the article, and I hope they'll they'll buy the book. I've heard a lot about it, and um, I wish you all the best. I've got some contacts in China, and maybe we can do some sort of um, show where we bring people from China. I know it, it was pretty hard when you did the first time uh to because these people get exposed to being public but uh hopefully we can do something because china is uh this new place where uh if there's growth there it'll it'll spread around the world that uh I, i'm i'm pretty encouraged with the people i've talked to in china that that they they sort of see it and you have the forces of the government there and the forces of the government here that have to overcome but it's it's i guess it's up to you and i to to do our part to to make it happen that we can't really rely on the government to do it for us thank you so much grant thank you and have a good day and uh hopefully we can do it again yes great thank you he stopped the tape